Let me know when it's ready. Yep. It is recording, it shows. Do you see my screen? Okay. Cool. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you Balaji for inviting me. And uh, we've been talking for quite a while and it's good to be joining the Zen4 quantum meetup today. Uh, just a little bit of my background, just introducing myself. Um, my background is uh, started professionally in pretty much hardware and uh, condensed matter physics. So I did my BA and master's in Cambridge doing condensed matter experimental physics. And then I went to Harvard to do applied physics where I designed chip structures and components. Then I went to Intel and doing silicon photonics, but also worked on maker projects. I know this group used to be called Zen4 Makers. So that's uh, actually uh, where my heart is. <laughs> so um, I did a lot of uh, open source hardware, uh, but I should say that my heart is also in quantum. When I joined Microsoft, I first was in the garage uh, manager of Silicon Valley uh, innovation program, the garage. And then uh, I moved to quantum systems to work on education of quantum computing. But then I have a parallel track of art and uh, fashion design wearables going on. So I have my own fashion brand called Art by Physicist, and I'm also working on some fashion tech projects at Microsoft. So this is perhaps a kind of a new, unique trajectory, a unique career path. Uh, it turned out that art has been very useful in my scientific studies. So in the following presentation, I'll be showing a lot of uh, concepts using art, in particular using drawings, com comics. So you don't have to have a really have a PhD in anything to, to work on quantum, unless you want to do hardware, you want to build the actual hardware, you probably want to um, have some electrical engineering or condensed matter physics background. But uh, to be a quantum developer and work on um, other parts of quantum computing, uh, you can come from anywhere. And all you need to know is to have some basic con conceptual understanding of what quantum computing is built on. Namely, these three important concepts, superposition, interference, and entanglement. And then you need a little bit of math, pretty much just linear algebra is not very difficult math. And uh, using programming languages such as q -sharp, which is our Microsoft's quantum language that Microsoft invented, you can very quickly apply these concepts, use math and start writing algorithms. You can build algorithms that you can run on hardware and you can use the cloud infrastructure to access quantum hardware. So today's class, we're going to look at one particular algorithm, Grover's algorithm. Uh, when I was chatting with Balaji, I was trying to understand what uh, the understanding of the group here. So uh, I think most people probably already know uh, a lot of concepts in quantum. So I wouldn't be repeating things like what, what is a qubit, what, uh, what, what are gates, so those basic things. Uh, but if you need more background, if you need more context, you can go to the Hackaday class that I have been teaching. This is the link uh, you can search. Just go to hackaday.io and search for Introduction to Quantum, Quantum Computing, or Quantum Computing with Comics. You'll be able to find, like, I think last one was 22nd session. So already we have done a lot of classes every week we meet on Sunday. Uh, because I'm speaking today here, I won't be doing another one tomorrow. But uh, in October, we have several guest lectures. So every week we discuss one particular topic. Grover's algorithm we have covered there. So if you need, when, after you go through today's class, if you need more uh, content, if you want to understand more, you can always go back to the recording on Hackaday. We are also using the q -sharp documentation for programming, for also looking up uh, information. And Quantum Cartas is a very useful tool that we use for self-paced learning. 
So today we'll be doing some coding at the same time that could hopefully give you not just a theoretical understanding of Groover's algorithm, but also doing it practically. Uh, also, by the way, all these materials I have uh, published into a little book. So this is available now. If you like, uh, if you like these comics, you can get them on Amazon. It's available in 13 markets. Uh, so this is kind of a companion book to the class that I mentioned. Is um, for some reason people still like printed books, so um, you can read the comics also online. But if you like uh, the book, you can search for the uh, the code, the link, or the title in Amazon. So algorithm, quantum algorithm has a pretty short history. Uh, just in the past decades, we have made a lot of development. So we know in the early 80s when quantum computing was first conceptualized that uh, we could build some machine that utilizes the laws of quantum mechanics. Then uh, several algorithms came about. So in 85, uh, Deutsch, David Deutsch, I don't know if uh, the audience here have already covered the Deutsch or deutsch hosa algorithms. So that uh, Deutsch has some very neat, simple algorithms to explain how interference works, uh, how to use interference to do some certain tasks more efficiently than classical algorithm. And Deutsch also proposed a uh, developed quantum Turing machine and showed the quantum circuits are universal. And uh, in 94, Peter Shor came up with the factorization algorithm. So we know that this is useful for uh, perhaps dangerous for cryptography because uh, we are using uh, mostly the RSA encryption scheme. And then uh, it relies on classical computer being invisible to factorize some really large numbers. But then using quantum algorithms, we can factorize really large numbers very effectively. So that makes us want to develop other types of host quantum cryptography encryption methods so that we'll, we wouldn't um, be having all of our encryption broken. So if you want to look at Deutsch algorithm, Schwartz algorithm, you can go to the Hackaday class that I mentioned earlier. So today we're gonna look at uh, Groover as an example. And um, it is a search algorithm that can be more efficient to search for particular uh, items in an unsorted list. Could be more efficient than classical algorithms. In general, quantum algorithms just leverage the key concepts superposition, interference, and entanglement. These are the only three. You don't actually need a lot of uh, quantum mechanics to do quantum programming. So these are the three key concepts. If you need uh, information, more step-by-step uh, -step guide, you can also look up on previous classes I mentioned. So Grover's algorithm is um, invented by um, Indian American computer scientist, Love Grover, is uh, using exactly the superposition, interference, and entanglement to very efficiently find items in unsorted list. I like to give people like a, a metaphor. It's like if you are going to a library, if the library is very disordered. You have actually, you know the title of the book that you're trying to find, but the library doesn't organize the books in any reasonable way. So classically, uh, you have to look at each title one by one. And then uh, if you are unlucky, maybe the very last book that you look at is the one that you're looking for. But uh, using quantum phenomena, you can put the, all the titles into this algorithm all together is not parallel computing, but is interference between all the possibilities. So at the end of the algorithm, you are doing, uh, 
you, you are extracting out the information that you were looking for. It has the highest amplitude when you do a measurement, whereas the other ones, they would uh, destructively interfere with each other and cancel, cancel out. So it is kind of um, a race. Uh, so Grover's, we can prove that using Grover's algorithm, the scale of your uh, search, like I mentioned, if classical, you may have to do, if you have uh, bits to represent your items and you have n bits, you may have to do two to the n times uh, to run your algorithm. But then uh, for Grover's, it could be two to the n over two, which is more efficient if you have a really large n. So we will, see, we will see some kind of crossover. So we don't know what factor it will actually be because it depends on the type of hardware they're using. So intrinsically, your computer can take uh, A amount of time or B amount of time to do the classical uh, quantum algorithms. But then the scale is what's important here. So at certain point, uh, you will see that Grover would be more efficient than the classical one. So it's like a race between the fastest supercomputer, the best classical computer that we have, with a quantum computer. At some point, the quantum computer is going to be more efficient. But then this number can be really large. So it comes back to developers now that we should also need to, as a field, as quantum computing, as a field, that we need to look for other types of algorithms that could leverage a smaller number of, of qubits that could be more efficient than classical computing. So that's an ongoing research. So right now we don't have any machine hardware that's able to run a Grover's algorithm at a really uh, just a, you could, you could have a small number of qubits, but if you run it, it's not going to be uh, useful. So only when the number is large enough, you can prove the usefulness. So yeah, I just plotted them by plugging some numbers and putting some uh, random constants A and B. So before we go to the algorithm, we need to mention the concept of Oracle. I don't know how familiar uh, the audience is about Oracle. Should I, should I talk through it or is it um, everyone understands it? I can skip. Yes. Mm. Kitty, it'll be great if you can just uh, oh, give a quick overview of Quantum Oracle. Sounds good. And I think someone needs to mute themselves because it's getting a little bit feedback and noise. So Oracle, uh, is a part of the algorithm that takes in the uh, both the input and output of your algorithm and then uh, outputs out some other data. So classically, if you have a function f of x, you would say you can uh, put all of the inputs into that function and then get a number, get a, a piece of data out. So in this case, we have a truth table. If we have three uh, numbers as our x inputs, and we can, we can say that uh, perhaps this one is the one we're looking for, and then that's why y equals to f of, um, f of 110 equals to 1. Uh, but we can't quite write something like this in quantum algorithms because we need to satisfy the fact that in quantum, the quantum operations all have to be reversible. So what is reversible? Uh, if you have learned about gates, you will, you will see that the gates are matrices that's applied on vectors and the matrices are uh, unitary. So unitarity of gates of matrices would enable you to make sure that a operation is reversible. But we can't quite get something like this to be like that because, for example, 
if you have um, input x, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. So f of 0 is 0, 1, 2, 3, but then it repeats to be 0, 1, 2, 3. Then if you have a, a number, say, uh, 3 for y, you wouldn't be able to distinguish if it is a 3 or 7 that gave that 3 in the, in the y. So we can't simply write something like this for a quantum algorithm because it's not reversible. But uh, we can write something like this on the right-hand side. This is uh, represented in the qu quantum circuit where each line can represent a set of qubits. And then you have this box, this oracle here. What, it, what this box outputs is the input x registries and the y tensor product with the f of x. So there are some maths, you can go through it and try to prove it. I would not go through it today, but I would provide the slides and you can go through. You will quickly find that if you construct your algorithm this way, you would be able to distinguish and go back from any number here to its original uh, input x. So that makes sure that your uh, operation is reversible. That's what you need for this kind of algorithms in that uses uh, interference and entanglement. So Goover's, Schor's, Deutsch algorithm all have oracles in them. And when you write them out like a quantum circuit, it's just a box in your algorithm. And this is our oracle for Goover's. And we're gonna look into it and see how that works. But just zooming out on the higher level, what Groover's algorithm do is, does is uh, you start with some input qubits, they're all initialized to zero. So you have a state zero, zero, zero in there. And I'm just using small, small number and equals to three just because uh, that's easy to see. And uh, then you put the H gates on each of them that would make each of them become uh, a superposition state. So they together will be in this superposition with equal probability. And then uh, the third step is note there is a y qubit coming in and is at first also initialized to zero, but then you get an x here that makes it a one. Uh, I will show you later what happens um, by this step. But what this qubit comes into this box is that it actually labels the one that you're looking for with a negative amplitude. So whatever you set up in this box is letting you label the, the item. So in this case, it's 101. It gets a negative amplitude. The next step is this box here it does a reflection over the mean value of all of the amplitudes. So if you do the maths, you, for this particular example, it's 0.26. If you draw a line here, it reflects all of the amplitude. So these original ones that are higher reflects down, but this one that was negative re reflects up. So you see that this one has gained amplitude by, by these two boxes. Then the next step is doing some iterations between these two boxes to enhance the effect of these two steps. So eventually, after several iterations, you'll be able to get the most amplitude, the most probable result out of the one that you labeled in that oracle. So let's take a look at the uh, specific oracles. We, have, we can show some examples. Say so again, we use three qubits. If you have um, three qubits as your input register, input registry, and um, your say in this case you want to label one one zero, what you have in this box is this control 
uh, circuit, which has a X gate applied to what whichever qubit that was a zero. In the case of one and zero, uh, we will have these two X gates around the last qubit. And then these three together is doing a control to the last Y qubit there, this target. If you are familiar with uh, C naught, like the control not gate, you know that there are two qubits and it's a matrix that would flip the last qubit based on the value of the first one. So I have drawn here for C naught, uh, if your first qubit is a zero, then your second qubit, your target qubit wouldn't change. But if your first qubit is a one, your uh, target qubit would then flip from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1. Similarly, if you have more qubits, you can use all of the earlier ones as your control and then flip your last qubit if all of the above ones are 1s. So in the 1, 1, 0 case, because the, the third one is 0, it wouldn't do anything to the last qubit. So you have to put the X gates to flip that zero into a one in order to have this uh, control happening. Uh, we should come back to this, I think. I'm here just to show the Z gate and X gate what happens because we, we're gonna use them later. So for people who haven't seen this before, um, yeah, let's come back to this. So, oh yeah, so this um, tells us the X gate is just a simple flip. If you just have one qubit, if you have probably seen block sphere, it's just making a zero to one and one to zero. Or if anything is in superposition, is uh, flipping the each state. So one one zero, you have the x gates on the third qubit. If you have zero one zero, you have you put x gates for the first and third. If your original input are already one on one, you don't have to put any X gate. In order to have this control work, you need to have all, all three qubits, input qubits to be, zero, uh, to be one. That's why we have the X gates here. So that's how you set up the, the oracles or black boxes, where it, depending on what number you want to label, you put the corresponding X gates on them. So, when you start the circuit, I mentioned you have them uh, initialized to zero. And then uh, if you look at the overall state of the system, when you just start, just looking at the first three qubits, you have them all in one. So this one has a, a maximum amplitude one. But if you apply H gates onto each of them, then it puts all of them into a equal superposition state. I haven't talked about this part yet. It's gonna be introduced now. Uh, then you look at this oracle here. In this case, we have a one zero one. So what this la very last qubit does is introducing a negative sign. So it comes in with a zero initialized, but then if you apply an X gate, it will become one. And if you do a H gate, it will give you two uh, states that's in superposition, so zero minus one for your last qubit. So that's why you can introduce a negative sign in your system. And that negative sign only goes to the state that you're trying to label. So if you have anything else in this box, uh, it wouldn't work because the one that you labeled is 101. And you put uh, a negative sign here to entangle with all of them. So that negative sign gets carried over to the 101 state and with the other ones not changing. This is what this last qubit is used for. It introduces this negative sign. Then the next box 
let's ignore these edge gates for now. If you look at this, it looks very similar to the first one. It basically tells you it would uh, have the uh, control happening if all of the three are zeros and then gets flipped to ones and then that could uh, then be able to entangle with the last qubit. So from the previous experience, you know that if you introduce a negative sign gets entangled with it, it would label the, for this case, the first one, because only 0, 0, 0 will be able to give you a uh, result. So if you write out all the mathematical functions of each qubit, each state, you will see the uh, first one first get a negative sign. And then if you multiply everything out, it gives you a flip from this very last qubit here. So at first, without this x, you get this, just like we saw in the last uh, page. But then having that negative sign introduced, it would then flip all of them, which means your 0, 0, 0 becomes positive. So that's how the second box works. But then we have these h gates around both sides of that box. That's actually a really cool part of this algorithm is that it can provide you this flip around the, the mean value of all of the amplitude. How do you think about it intuitively? So H gate, we know if you're looking at the block sphere, it would put zero to a plus state, which is written here. It will put a one to a minus state, which is written here. So it's kind of effectively uh, changing your basis from this x, uh, from the z axis to the x axis. And again, if you apply the h gate to plus and minus, it reverses back to the zero and one. That's what happens when you have one qubit with uh, h gate. But if you have something that allows you to rotate around the zero state, which is the x axis, and that's what we just saw, is allowing you to rotate around here, but then applying the h gate on both sides, you effectively end up with a state like this, which is effectively a flip over the mean. But here for simplicity, I'm only drawing one qubit because that's the only time we can really use block sphere to visualize. Anything more than one qubit wouldn't be useful for uh, using a block sphere. But if you can imagine in the block sphere, when you have more qubits, you're adding more dimension in your system. But as humans, we aren't able to visualize more than three dimensions. So, but you can infer something similar will happen. If whatever you have put into this box uh, that allows it to rotate around the zero for all of your multi-qubit state, adding all of these uh, H gates around it will allow you to get a rotation, a reflection over me. So that's how the whole algorithm is set up, is very elegant and very cool. And it gives you, if you think about it in that intuitive way, it actually is like you just effectively using interference to, uh, so you introduce that negative sign and then you can entangle with your other qubits and then you can get whatever you want as the maximized amplitude. And how many, so you, you will repeat these two, depending on how big, how large your system is, you will repeat this two steps several times to enhance the effect. 
but how many times is needed? How do we actually, I mentioned it, two to the n over two, how do we get that, num that number? There is a way to prove it, and it can be, you can prove it purely um, mathematically writing down all the states and all the equations, but there is also a trigonometrical way to prove it, and it's uh, quite, quite interesting and cool to see. Is you can imagine just simplifying your multi qubit state into something smaller. You know that each state is orthogonal to each other. If you project that onto a two dimensional space, then you can write, you can draw two orthogonal axes. And one of them is the, the one that you were starting with, but then eventually, so when you were starting with, you had a state that's like this, but then eventually you wanted to be this state. So that state, you can label it as uh, this vertical axis here. How do you move your overall system from this state to that state? That's what Grover's algorithm is doing. First, you do the, the H gates, and that will allow you to end up on a state with uh, equal superposition. If you write out the state, you would see that it has a projection cosine theta onto B and a projection sine theta onto A. So you can, you can calculate the amplitude of how much B is in the system and how much A is in the system. But we also know that when you do a H gate is in equal superposition, so you know the amplitude is one over square root of two uh, to the n. Just keeping this number here, we're gonna use it later. And then the, what the next step does is allowing you to flip this one to a negative amplitude. This is reversing this vector down into this state. So you have a theta and then you, you flip it to a theta, negative theta there. And then the next step is you would flip from this step to this new state, phi dash. When you do the H gates around that uh, box that I mentioned earlier, you, when you're doing the mean, so this vector here is effective the mean, because if you look at the angle, if you want to flip over the mean, you flip two theta away from this original state. So from here to here is flipping over the mean value. So now if you write out what your state is, phi new state, phi dash, uh, if you just flip it once, it would be three thetas projected onto B and uh, three sine three theta projected onto A. If you have done this k times, then you can you can write out that after k times phi dash is two k plus one times theta, and then you do a cosine and a sine projection onto B and A. So if you do this a large number of times you can approximate. One thing that frustrates me is how little people. Okay, I think David is uh, not talking to me. <laughs> so when you have a really large N, you can write out a large number of iterations. You can just approximate the sign with, uh, of this angle will equal to this angle. And then you can plug in this earlier number theta. So if uh, n is really large, theta would be approximately one over square root of two over n uh, with the power of n. Then you can then find out this is in the order of square root of two to the n. So that's how one way we can prove how many iterations will be needed for Grover's algorithm to work. So that's the theory part. And we have a lot of exercise. We have a lot of 
coding uh, for you to get familiarized with how to use Groover, how to set up Groover's algorithm. So today we're gonna use the perhaps the entry point, a kata, quantum katas that sets up the Groover's algorithm. I have provided uh, these links where you can find all these great examples of Groover's algorithm or written in C sharp you can try later. So let's take a look at the katas now. If you're uh, comfortable with coding your search engine, this GitHub repository will come up. Uh, let me get a step back. You will see that in this repository, we'll have all these different folders. Each of them is a kata that helps you walk through each concept in quantum computing. There's also a tutorials folder where you can go in and read and practice writing the code step by step. So to practice what you learn theoretically in quantum algorithms, you can immediately already get very hands-on. So we're going to use the Groover's algorithm in this folder. And we have them on Jupyter Notebook. So you don't have to uh, install anything. You can just directly go there and it's loaded on Binder. But you can also download it, clone it locally. And we have the documentation that shows you how to run it. If you go to Microsoft Quantum Documentation, you'll be able to find all these uh, different types of resources that helps you get started with writing quantum algorithms. And there are many different ways and IDEs you can use. So this Jupyter Notebook here is useful for like a class like this. We don't have to install anything, but sometimes you want to do a local development, then just follow the instructions here and um, get started with the all kinds of options of development environment. When you come into the binder of Google's algorithm, just run the package first. And then we're gonna do a couple of uh, exercises just to give you a flavor. We got, we're not gonna do all of it. So let's see, how do we set up this Google's algorithm in QSharp? So the very first task is just a very simple introduction that helps you see how to do a oracle and you can set up all kinds of oracles. So the first one is probably uh, the easiest. It asks you to make oracle to label the all one states. So uh, it also tries to show you examples. If all of them are zero, then nothing happens. If there's any zero, nothing happens. Only flip the very last qubit if you have all one state. So you just simply do uh, a Can you think for the benefit for the benefit of users uh, and uh, attendance. Can you zoom the screen a bit, please? Oh, it's still too small. Okay. Yes, small. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is it better? Much better now. Thank you. Okay, great. So this one you can do uh, just as what. Uh, this setup is, but here you don't have a zero. This box has a zero for your second qubit, but here you just have all ones. You, so you don't have to do any uh, anything, uh, any x gates, additional x gates. But what you would do, what you would do is a controlled x gate, because that is what this one is. This without ignore these two x here. But this here is a control X. So a C naught is effectively a controlled X. So all of your input qubits are the registers. So you would write query register. These are the ones you're given. And then your last qubit is the target. So this is how you will set up Oracle for the all one state. Uh, if you put in the correct answer, 
successfully, it would uh, run and also show you successful. But we don't have to wait for this. I'm hoping you are also doing this on your computer so you can see instantaneously what's happening. Uh, we won't do the, the other oracles, but I'm just showing you that the second task is giving you the 1010. So you first need to set up uh, a state that is in that state and then do the uh, control C, uh, control X. So it involves like a, a for loop. So Q sharp, you can write classical algorithm. You can write uh, like how you would write Python, for example, is compatible. So yeah, two to three, uh, two to four, try it at home yourself, just uh, different types of oracles. Then it asks you to do the iterations. So task 2.1 is first asking you to do a Hardamar transformation. So basically this one here, you see that all of the H is applied to the register qubits. Uh, you could say something like, for all the qubits in the register, apply a H gate to, to each, to them. So you can write a for loop, but then you could also have a very short command called apply to each. So Q sharp really is trying to simplify your syntax. This is very intuitive. You are applying to each. And I put an A here because this is an adjoint. If it's not giving you an adjoint, you don't have to have an A. So how do you, how do you actually understand these? You can look up on these uh, commands. They're all in the documentation, the q -sharp library and API documentation. They're all in there. They're, they have a really big library. Um, and if you look for like, apply to each, apply to each A, you will be able to see the all about that command. So the A here means adjoint. And what is adjoint? I mentioned reversible um, matrices earlier and unitary. So adjoint, if you look at the mathematics of unit uh, unitary matrices, you will see that it has an adjoint and basically is uh, letting us do a reversible version of this. But yeah, if it's not a, a given you an adjoint version, you don't have that you don't have to write the A there. So here you just do uh, apply H gate to each register. And that will be your Hadamard transformation step. Let me see the earlier step should probably yeah is done and it's successful. Yeah, this one is also done. Then the conditional phase flip, this is the most interesting part, um, is this here. So I told you earlier that we could use the very last qubit as our x, uh, as our phase, the minus sign introduction step. But there are other ways to introduce a minus sign. And here is really requiring the other way because you see that what we've been given does not include the target, not the last qubit. We're only given the register here. So we have to use a different way to introduce that minus sign. Turns out you could also use the, the Z gate. Uh, I flashed you with this picture earlier. What the Z gate does is exactly introducing a minus sign is a rotation around the z axis if you look at the block sphere when you have one qubit. So it intrinsically includes a negative sign there and we can actually use it for this step here. And we don't even need to use the very last qubit. So if you do the math, you, you find out that uh, this box here effectively also gives you that negative sign that you needed to flip all the amplitudes. So 
what you need to do is uh, applying all of the register qubits with the X gates and then having this control Z going on. So how you would write that is also having some uh, clever trick in Q sharp. There is a very concise way to represent exactly this. Within the X gates, you apply this control Z gate. You can exactly write that out like a within apply and then just write what you need inside. So within the apply to each, again, we have an adjoint version, we put an E, uh, bracket, yeah. We have the um, X gates, and then do that to all registry. And then in the apply, you do the controlled Z. Okay, so what do you put in here? You want the first few qubits to be your control for the control Z and only the last qubit to be your target. Uh, but we're only given the register. There's no other type. So how, what do we, what do we do that the most efficiently? I think you could, you could uh, write like a loop and say a label each uh, register, but there is actually a simple way to uh, just say, I want the very last qubit to do this. And there is a command called tail. And if you look it up, it's uh, basically the returns the last element of the array. So you want to use this tail function, but also this is a library that you would need to use tail function. So you need to first open this library in order to use it and then do your tail register. And what is, what's the opposite? What's the control now? All of the rest. Turn out uh, they have another one that's uh, all of the, all of the elements except the last element is called uh, most. You can find all of these in the documentation. So that's your reflection over mean box right there. So the very last bit is uh, asking you to put all of them together. So you would just copy what you previously set up step by step. Remember we had a um, oracle, but those are just exercises of oracles that it asks us to set up. Now here it just tells us that we have an oracle here, just use it. So we can say oracle um, register again. Uh, if you have uh, a different oracle you want to use, you can just grab early on what you define things like uh, oracle all once and query register you, you plug in this step. And then the next step is the, uh, the H gates. And again, you have done it earlier. So you do a Hadamard transform. Then you would do this reflection over mean, and that one is called a conditional phase flip. But you have, again, very last part is your Hardeman transform. So that's, that's how you set up the iteration.
and uh, we are about time, so I would let you finish this. I will also want to point you to other places that you can get more about Grover's algorithm. I mentioned earlier we have the documentation, and in the documentation, you will find the tutorials. And these are the step-by-step -step introductory tutorials, like how do you make a random generator, number generator, how do you use entanglement? So basically that's a teleportation algorithm. And we have Groovers, we have some other examples. So in Groovers, if you go in there, you will find um, a step-by-step -step explanation. And we have a sample code. You can copy and paste the sample code into your IDE. You could also go to the actual GitHub. It tells you how to run this example. You can also go to the actual sample code GitHub page and download the whole thing here. So I've already done that. I have my Groover's uh, folder open. And you will see that it has two Q sharp per ones. And this one uh, basically sets up what we just did in the katas, but in a very concise way and a, a complete way. And it also helps us calculate what number of iterations will be, depending on how many qubits you are defining. And in this reflection dot Q sharp here, you can define how you want to set up your qubit. Uh, your uh, oracle, and then uh, just read through all these, and that's basically exactly what we did with the, the kata steps. But it gives you a very good uh, idea of how do you put a whole search, Google search algorithm together and run this. So I will, I will leave this to the group to do that as homework. So for anyone who finish any katas, if you Finish the groovers, take a screenshot, take a or like a picture of you completing the groovers algorithm katas or anything, any kata in the uh, in these different folders. You can post it on LinkedIn or Twitter and at me and Microsoft Quantum, I will give you a uh, certificate where you can print out anything. So there are people who have already done that. Here are some examples. So I would love to see people learn and try things out themselves. And really, I got feedback from the uh, learners that after they took the katas, it really helped them get a lot of understanding and it, it forced them to look things up. So do that. I look forward to see this group contributing. And then a few words about uh, quantum computing career overall and where you can find further learning materials. How do you get a step up? At, like at the beginning, um, Balaji told me that a lot of audience here are already listening to a lot of talks and trying some things but want to step up and um, perhaps be a professional quantum developer someday. So in quantum computing, we have lots of different roles. And they're all very, very important to work together and uh, build this whole new industry. So like Grover is one example of the algorithm creator and I have Peter Shore here. So someone who comes up with new algorithms that solves certain problems better than classical computers can do. That's extremely important. We have programmers who use the algorithms for applications and tools that they're building. And they may have a software background. And we have researchers who build actual hardware. And uh, also they, they may be uh, studying quantum properties and quantum effects and need to use quantum computers to, to help them understand so they can do simulations. We also have people like uh, Albert here who's an educator and who's able to communicate scientific ideas to the general public and to people who have specific needs. Um, usually they can have any, any STEAM background. Uh, 
and we have curious learners, if they push themselves and they can get to the next level and become the, the next generation of the quantum workforce. Uh, I also mentioned the hardware builders who may have um, physics or engineering material science background. So, uh, and also early adopters. Without them, then any new technology is not going to scale. So uh, people will understand how quantum computing can solve their problems, help their business and start adopting very early on. Because this is a new emerging field, it would take years. Usually new technology take decades to have traditional in the industries start using them. So having all people with understanding, knowing how quantum computing can help their particular industries is very important. So you're here, you're the out of the box thinker. You can be anywhere on this map and contribute to the development of the field. So if you are looking for additional learning materials based on where you are, um, I showed you a lot of comics. We have the MS Learn modules, the aka.ms slash learnqc is a great place to get started with uh, understanding computing from doing practical coding to the concept. We have a Google search. So that's also why I want to do the Google here. We just have this new module for you to try using what we learned today, uh, not just setting up the, the algorithm, but actually use it. And we have um, optimization problems where we use quantum inspired methods to solve perhaps classical optimization problems. And I show you the quantum cadets, also the algorithm samples. As you gradually go uh, from being a curious hobbyist to professionals, you start doing more contributions. All of our documentation and uh, APIs, libraries, compilers are all open source. So you can already go to the GitHub and start contributing. So here is a lot of ways to learn and a lot of places you can be. For any questions about uh, the topics, you can always look up on um, posts uh, in Hackaday project I showed earlier and uh, recordings for, from the previous classes are there. Uh, again, uh, it has a companion book that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, coming up in, on Sundays, we have some special classes so next Sunday at Hackaday, we have Dr. Maria Shaw teaching quantum machine learning. And then we have Dr. Michael Bivalent talking about quantum error correction. Then on 25th, uh, Professor Chris Ferry would talk about quantum tomography. So uh, in addition to the classes that um, I give, so here they are. Let me show you again. Uh, this is the quantum computing through comics on Hackaday. If you want to look at any of the topics that we didn't discuss today, we've already got 22 sessions. So you can find recordings and download the PowerPoint, the slides. So if you need anything before Groovers, more basic. Or if you want to revise Groovers, we have already, we have three classes on that also. Here are the links for all the open source repositories that we uh, have made available for the communities to contribute. You can find all of this, don't have to worry about all the links because you can find all of them in our documentations. And then uh, lastly, on Microsoft Quantum website, you probably have been there already there is a survey you can take where you can let us know what materials you, you are interested in and um, perhaps where you are here and then um, inform us what uh, we can help you with. Last announcement is uh, Hacktoberfest is here. Uh, Microsoft Quantum is participating. So 
our open source repositories have issues labeled with Hacktoberfest. This, if you haven't heard about Hacktoberfest, is a open source um, contribution movement or ha hackathon within the month of October. Any GitHub repository that's open, public, they could have the Hacktoberfest label on them for community contributions. So we are there. Definitely look up on the uh, on our repositories. Uh, we also have a kickoff meeting on October 8th. So I will share this slide to people and you can uh, access these links then. All right, thank you very much for having me. That's it for today. Thanks, um, Kitty, for uh, giving a telescopic view of um, Groover's algorithm. At the same time, uh, microscopic view also. It was very enlightening us. And uh, I'll open the floor for a question and answer session. And there is a question already raised by Sydney. Um, I'll read it out. Are the second X gates on each qubit line there to keep the Oracle unitary? Um, if there is a question from Sydney in the chat. Oh yeah, the second here. Yes, or the second states on each qubit line there to keep the Oracle unitary. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think so. I haven't thought about it that way. I think it's, because uh, if you want to have two oracles next to each other, you want to be able to reverse it back. Any other questions? Kitty, one curiosity question. This is Virendra here. And the question is about solutioning and where effectively Microsoft as a group and solution engineers, they are providing something commercial or about to go commercial in this area using, for example, any of these uh, good concepts. Mm -hmm. We already have. We have the Azure Quantum, which is our cloud service. Uh, we have that already in private preview. So we already have customers using our solutions on the cloud right now at the moment. So it will be, it will be open to public uh, at some point. Right now is, is private preview. So Microsoft's customers are using. Kind of beta customers? Um, I, yeah, we don't call them beta customers, but sure, we, we have um, when you have something new, you have a starting point. Right. Yeah. And there must be some terminology, I'm sure Microsoft if specific. Wanna, if you want to learn more about what uh, case studies there are already, you can find them on Microsoft's blog. So uh, if you go to Microsoft's uh, quantum website, it's all on there. So Azure Quantum is the service that I mentioned is the cloud service and we make our tool, tooling and solvers available. And if you want to see what are the customer use study uh, use cases, you can find all these blogs that talks about different applications that we have already built. Thank you. I was basically exactly looking for that, that mm -hmm. if you want share anything in terms of using the service, what people have really yeah. been able to resolve and make a difference, if you want to comment on that. Yeah. You can also find uh, who's already on Azure Quantum. These are our partners. Uh, they have servers and hardware that's built on Azure. And you can also look at all these customer case studies that we have written about. Okay, thank you. I see quite a lot of chat uh, questions in the chat, but uh, yeah, I've already mentioned the recordings and also the S gates. That's a good question. Uh, 
supplemental text for today. Yes, this slides will be shared. What is binder and my binder? What is quantum catalyst? So quantum catalyst I have explained is an um, open source GitHub repository that contains all these self-paced learning materials. Like um, we could we could be doing if um, this class needed the the basic gates kata that's the very beginning entry point where you just practice how to use different kinds of gates. We also have visualization to show you how to um, how these states are changing as you apply different gates. Binder is just a host. It hosts Jupyter notebook, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not required for Q-sharp coding at all. It's just an IDE. So you can download the uh, repository and run it on Visual Studio. Uh, in fact, I just showed you my Visual Studio just now. Uh, Visual Studio code and all kinds of IDEs. You can run Q-sharp standalone on your terminal as well. So all of how to, how to do all of these are all on our documentation. Um, someone asked about um, Korea. Why did I draw Microsoft? Why not IBM? I draw Microsoft uh, not directly to the quantum team. Uh, as I mentioned, I was the manager of the Silicon Valley Garage program. And quantum was a very interesting topic for me. So people in the garage are um, all encouraging employees to try different areas and build new innovations. And quantum was a very new area overall. And I was interested because I'm a physicist. So that I started learning. I actually, I was like all of you guys, I was a hobbyist and I started learning everything that is uh, available. And physics definitely helped uh, because the basic concepts are physics phenomena. And um, but coding in QSharp was completely new. So I just started following everything and started coding and started learning just like everybody else. So that was a natural transition. About how many years it took to do that transition, Kitty? About a year. So I actually just started learning uh, after a couple months, I started teaching. And I was teaching uh, our employees about quantum. I was having classes like this, but That's in person and amazing. with our employees. Yeah, so, yeah then uh, after I joined Microsoft, I started teaching external communities. And building these materials are one of my jobs. By the way, very creative material. Thank you. Very well done, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, this uh, quantum is a re uh, really um, kind of a very serious matter, but make it a fun way to learn is very uh, creative. Um, and also, I would like to know what is the future of the quantum now? After five years, it will be um, available to all um, common people. It is now, it is only big corporations that will have the access. And, uh, how, and also, we can access some extent, but is it uh, going to be uh, like a personal PC can be uh, access, uh, available to all consumers um, or uh, it may take some more years? You mean hardware? Hardware, yeah. hardware would be more like data centers, like infrastructure. Uh, we, we don't have a data center in our home, right? <laughs> but uh, we have all the cloud computing in the data centers happening there. So quantum computing is very likely to, to be like that first. And it's going to help a lot of heavy industry problems rather than personal problems because our everyday problems don't even need quantum. So uh, research is a very big area. So academics would need it very much. They run into limitations in uh, simulations, materials, discoveries, all kinds of simulations that our current classical computers cannot do very well. Perhaps quantum computing can help. There are also problems like 
um, optimization, data processing, security, those have applications in quantum. And definitely the kind of medicine computing we are stuck into nowadays for COVID yeah. compute. Yeah. Yeah, so you can access the hardware through your PC, through your, through, through your personal computers. Uh, like I mentioned, the Azure Quantum service is a way for you to get your hands on the hardware. You're not uh, having literally like a dilution refrigerator in your home, but somewhere in a lab in the world. They have uh, some, some hardware probably don't need cooling, like the photonics chip type of quantum computing. Perhaps they have to cool some part, but not all of it. Uh, so setups right now are, are very complex. If you're interested in the hardware, I also have a couple of classes discussing the hardware, different types of hardware. So yeah, just uh, I had a, one class on topological qubits in particular, but I have an overview on hardware some early in some early classes. This one, yeah, you can find all of these online. If you have questions, you can post them. Um, in this in the chat of this project so at the very bottom here there's a um, discussion chat so i usually get a notification and i will come back to respond thank you yeah yeah someone's asking if there are diy project hardware projects i'm not sure but perhaps on hackaday there are if you search for home hardware but as i mentioned it's very delicate setup, it's very hard to build. So uh, it's good if you learn the fundamental physics and experimental physics to understand what is required for building hardware. And uh, coding and programming is all free and open source and is already available. So you can already leverage that. Cool. Thanks, everyone. That's it for the day, I think. Yeah, thank you all uh, for coming. Um, I will post the recording of this session uh, in uh, Zen for Quantum Meetup site. Uh, you can go through the uh, links and everything provided in that. So you can practice this. Um, hey, Balaji, we're um, yes. recording. We may not be able to access the links. So if you want to post links also separate. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be helpful uh -huh. because when you play the recording on YouTube, you may not be able to access all you have to type or everything. So just a set of links separately. Yeah, that will be. Yeah, I will also post, I'll post the link on the Hagaday page as well. So can I ask a question? Sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, how how does uh, quantum technology affect uh, AI? Because uh, I yeah I'm very curious about that. Yeah, it's a developing field. There is definitely research uh, on quantum uh, machine learning. So perhaps you want to come to our next class by. Uh, Dr. Maria Schott. She's actually going to show us some examples of quantum machine learning. On our documentation page, we also have a machine learning library. Is at the very beginning, it's basically the status quo. If you walk through the library and you try the samples there, you pretty much see where our field is at. Uh, okay, thank you a lot. And would it be possible that you uh, give uh, me the email address because uh, I, I don't know if it's, uh, it, if it's possible to have further information. Yeah, um, if you get in touch, you can add me on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, could you type it down on the uh, chat box? Cause yeah, I just did early. Search for my name on LinkedIn. 
Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.